Threads launched a year ago and became the fastest growing app in history, gaining 100 million users in just five short days. A year later, Threads has over 200 million users. And in the Threads for iOS app, maintaining high performance has been essential to supporting that kind of growth. Now, if you haven't heard of Threads before or you haven't used it, it's Meta's newest social app. It's a place where people can go and post updates about what's going on in the world around them and engage in friendly conversation with other people. And the, the Threads app has changed a lot in the last year. If you go to last year's Mobile at Scale talk, you can hear from engineer Cameron Roth about how we were able to build the Threads iOS app so quickly in just five months. And the reason we were able to do that is because Threads is based a lot on Instagram. Instagram provides the core code for Threads. It means we get a lot of things for free. Everything from the logging system to the layout system to the code that allows us to publish photos and videos. In the year since we've shipped, the iOS app has really grown up. If you use Threads, you may have seen a lot of really neat user features that we've launched. There's a GIF chooser, we have audio posts, tags, a lot of cool in integrations with Instagram, a lot of safety features. You can tweak your timeline by saying what posts you're interested in or not interested in by sliding left or right. You can save posts to read later. There's a lot. And there's also been a lot of performance features too, which aren't necessarily user-facing. For example, we reduced our app binary size, so the app is actually faster to download and faster to launch. And if you're a developer like I am on the app, it actually takes half the time to build threads than it does to build Instagram in non-incremental builds. On the Threads iOS app, we've also continued to adopt a lot of modern Swift language features like Swift concurrency that reduces data races and prevents crashes. We also launched some really big features too. For example, when the search tab was launched a year ago, it really didn't have a lot of content. You could search for users and that was about it. Now we have trending topics in some countries and you can search for content by keyword and you can choose how that content is presented to you, either ranked by relevance or recency. We also launched our integrations into the Fediverse. And if you haven't used the Fediverse, it's this really cool new set of open protocols that allows social media servers to communicate with each other. It's kind of like the social media equivalent of a distributed network like DNS or email. And what this means for you as a Threads user is if you opt in, you can actually publish your content outside of Threads to these other servers so people can subscribe to you. And you can subscribe to people who are not on threads posting content, and you can read it within threads. It's truly the future of massively scalable social media, and we're really, really excited to be part of it. We also threw a big birthday party for threads. Users got party hats, there was confetti, there were scratch-off app icons that were special for the birthday. That was a really neat feature. On the iOS app, we built that entirely in SwiftUI in just a matter of days, and it looked great. We have also launched a public API. We've welcomed millions of people in Europe to Threads, and we built an entirely new web client at threads.net, which I recommend you check out if you haven't. Most importantly to me, I joined Threads a year ago too. I've been working on messaging for the last 20 years in both email security and in iOS development and social media. And I knew this would be a very fun app to work on, and the team could not be a better group of people to work with. I started building iOS apps back in 2010 because I wanted to buy an iPad and I couldn't really justify the cost. So what I thought I would do is build an app and put it in the app store and maybe it would pay for the iPad, which it did. And since then I haven't really turned back. On threads, I get to work on things I care deeply about and including performance, as well as making software more accessible for everyone. It's the best app for public conversation, and I am proud to be part of it. So performance can mean a lot of things. It could be an app's impact on your phone's battery, how long it takes to launch the app, or if you scroll using the app, how many hitches or glitches you see, activity spinners, how much disk space you, the app uses, that kind of thing. On the Threads team, we believe that performance matters because the user experience matters. And nobody's going to want to use our app if the app is slow to launch, slow to use, or when they want to say something, it doesn't necessarily publish reliably. 
So for this reason, we consider performance on threads to be a first class concern. So let's start by talking a little bit about our performance philosophy. I mentioned that we have benefited from being built on Instagram's core. We get a lot from Instagram and the Instagram team continually improves the app, both Instagram and threads. So for example, we get really great alerting systems, monitoring systems, our layout system, shared frameworks for animations, a whole lot more. On the client infrastructure side, the Instagram team has helped make our code more modular. So it loads faster and the app launches faster. And of course, Instagram also provides a lot of the backend systems that make the app very, very scalable and has allowed us to gain so many people using threads in such a short period of time. Our performance philosophy on threads is really all about providing the best user experience. And to do that, we have to measure a lot of things. So let's dive into some of the metrics that we consider the most important. So first of all, there's crashes. Nobody wants to have the app crash, and that is the most important. We try and keep that to a minimum. But some of our other metrics, especially around the areas of content creation and consumption, are very important too. So here's four of them. Percent fire is the frustrating image render experience. This is the percent of users who experience images that are slow to load, or maybe the image is taking a while and they abandon the app entirely. We try and keep that to a minimum. Another metric is TTNC or time to network content. This is how quickly we can load content from our servers and display it on the device. And we try and keep that really low too. CPSR is creation publish success rate. And this is sort of a measure of how many people, when they go to publish something, actually succeed. And that can be posts that include text, photos, or video. And we try and keep that as high as possible. And lastly, there's navigation latency. This measures how fast the app is to use both navigating in the app from one area to another and to launch, whether from a cold start where the app is not resonant in memory or a warm start where it is. And there's a lot that can impact that. So today I'm going to go into depth into two of these areas, navigation latency and publish reliability. Navigation latency because if the app doesn't launch fast, people just aren't going to use it. And publish reliability because if people can't post reliably, there won't be a lot of content for other people to read and people will stop posting. So let's talk first about navigation latency. At the end of 2023, we knew we had to make performance a priority but we weren't entirely sure what we should work on first. So we decided to learn what users' biggest pain points were. So what we started with was what we call a boundary test. Now, we had actually run one of these in the past around replies. A boundary test is a test where you put inputs into a system that are extreme and you measure what the impact is from those inputs. So around replies, we knew that replies were slower to publish than original posts, and we knew we wanted to, to improve them, but we wanted to measure what the likely impact of improving them would be. So we injected a little bit of latency to replies and saw what the negative consequences were, and then could project what the positive consequences were. And that's, we focused a little bit on replies there. We did the same thing for navigation latency and app launch. So what we did was we injected a little bit of latency into three core areas, profile, conversations, that's where you see a post and all the replies, we call it the permalink, or your in-app notifications or the activity feed. These three surfaces actually, it turns out you can get to not just by navigating in the app, but by going into the app from somewhere else. For example, profile, if you're in Instagram and a user has logged into threads, they'll have a little threads icon on their profile. And if you tap on it, you'll switch over to threads. And we want that to be as fast as possible. So we injected latency into three buckets, ranging from 0.2 to 0.6 seconds and differing a little bit based on some other analysis we had done per service. And what we found was that iOS users do not tolerate a lot of latency at all. In general, they use the app less and they spent less time in the app, the more latency we injected. We also found that people interacted less with each other. They liked fewer posts. They generally followed accounts less, all kinds of things. On cold start, the more latency we added, the worse things got. It had significant impact. Fewer people used the app. They read fewer posts. 
And from all of these learnings, we knew that if we improved navigation latency and app start in these areas and elsewhere, we would likely see significant benefits. Now, a boundary test isn't the only thing that we use to measure latency in the app. We actually have a really cool tool that we built in-house called Slate. It's Instagram's systemic navigation latency logger. And it's a tool that measures latency by observing different app conditions. You can see it in the slide here where this green overlay is showing how long this profile took to load. Now, Slate is more than just a visual readout of how long it takes to load some content. It also can show you the difference between different kinds of events in the app. For example, we inject markers when a view starts to load, when it ends either with data showing or an, an empty state, when an activity spinner starts to animate or when it stops. And using these different kinds of markers, we can measure all kinds of things about latency in the app. And one really neat way that we use that in Threads for iOS was in our GraphQL migration. Now, I mentioned earlier that we have a new web client at threads.net. Well, it's new, it's built entirely to deliver content via GraphQL, which is generally more performant and can return smaller responses than legacy REST. But the iOS and Android apps, which were built on more of Instagram's legacy code, they used REST. So our backend engineers had to develop things and ship certain features in two different modes one for iOS and Android, and one for web. Well, we didn't want this. So we wanted everybody to move to GraphQL. We used Slate to measure what the impact of that would be before we adopted it entirely throughout the app. And what we did was we took the list of followers or accounts that you follow, accounts that follow you, and we made it possible to operate on both GraphQL and REST at the same time. And we were able to measure the difference. And what you can see in the graph here is that generally it was about the same. This is a measure of latency data comparing those two implementations. And using this data, we were able to say that we wanted to move entirely GraphQL for all new features in Threads for iOS. So next I want to talk a little bit about what the Threads iOS team is doing around publish reliability. We had introduced the basic ability to save a post as a draft in early 2024. It was one of our most requested user features. And at the time, we looked at bug reports from users, and we saw that a lot of people were, were had issues around publishing. They were either hitting rate limits, or they had authentication problems, they hit integrity features, and some of them just had network problems and they couldn't post. At the time, if you had one of those network problems, your only options were to discard the post entirely or try again, and often trying again would also fail. So what we did was we introduced drafts and then we quickly added a small feature that allowed people to save content as a draft if they encountered a network failure. And what we found was for the people who had this feature, they submitted 26% fewer bug reports around publishing. So we knew we were meeting a real user need, but we really wanted to measure the overall effectiveness of this small feature. And because not many people ran into network problems, it was hard to really get good data. And so now we actually had something happen that you don't think of as a good thing very often. And that's that we had a site-wide outage for about an hour while the test was running. This meant that nobody could access threads, but it also meant that a lot of people were able to use this new feature to save as draft on network failure. And you can see in the slide that there's a little bump during the period where there was this outage. And that's a lot of people who are using this new feature. So we were able to prove that we were also addressing a real user need here as well. This drafts feature also led to a learning exercise around disk space usage. So on iOS, when someone adds a photo or video in threads to our composer, they use a standard component called PHPicker view controller. This was introduced in iOS 14 by Apple as a secure way for users to provide a privacy centric way of act giving access to the photos in their gallery. For us, it means that when somebody selects a photo to add to the composer, we get a URL that points to it. But unfortunately, that permission to read that URL only persists for the current session. So if somebody restarts the app, we might no longer have permission to read that photo. Usually this isn't a problem unless we're trying to persist that photo for a long time 
say, as part of a draft. So we couldn't just point to the gallery. What we had to do was copy all photos and videos attached to a composer into a new location that would persist for a long time. This also meant that if somebody deleted a photo from the gallery, it would still be available in their draft. Unfortunately, there was a bug. And the bug was that these photos and videos that we had copied were not being cleaned up as they should have been. So we fixed the bug, and then we decided to use this as kind of a, an exercise in learning about disk space. So we started to clean up all the photos and videos that had not been cleaned up previously, and we looked at the results of our test. And the result was incredible. What we found was that by keeping disk space usage small, we impacted a lot of our performance metrics, as well as metrics just about app health in general. The app launched faster, we saw more daily users, more people were posting, more people were liking things. It was, it was really incredible. So one last cool thing that we did around publish reliability was looking at our existing publishing pipeline. This is how posting works on Threads iOS at the moment. And what we decided to do was make it a little less synchronous. So one of the steps in publishing is to, for example, transcode video or prepare photos for publishing. Well, instead of waiting until a user hits post, we now are able to do that a little sooner. We also migrated this entire publishing pipeline to Swift, and that allows us to prevent data races and reduce crashes by adopting strict Swift concurrency. And it's still in early testing, but all the data we've got is that the Swift version is actually driving important metrics like CPSR and publish reliability by just being more stable. So in your own apps, think about what your critical flows are. For threads, we knew these were things like app start, how content's delivered, how people can post, how people can read content. It will probably be different for you, but think about what your critical flows are and prioritize those as you're trying to think about performance. Use techniques like boundary tests to learn what the overall impact was going to be before you invest a lot of engineering resources. Second, performance is every engineer's job, especially if you're on a large team. So think about what metrics are important for you and make sure they don't regress as you deliver new code. And lastly, prioritize improving performance and sustaining a high level of performance. I mentioned that performance is a first class concern for us on the Threads team, and that's because we wanna provide an app that people actually wanna use. And when you don't have high performance, the app's just not gonna perform and people aren't gonna to wanna to use it. So what's next for performance and Threads for iOS? Well, we already have a roadmap going through 2026. We're going to continue adopting modern Swift, moving more of our code to strict concurrency and Swift 6 to protect against data races. We're also migrating a lot of that old Objective-C code to Swift, and we're going to reduce the number of activity spimmers, loading shimmers, that kind of thing that you see, and make the app launch faster. And in general, we're going to make a lot of performance improvements across critical areas of the app. And you can be part of this too. I, I mentioned earlier that bug reports have been really, really useful in us determining what the needs of our users are and if we're addressing them. So, and I'm not making this up, you can launch the app and you can shake your phone and it will present a mobile where you can submit a bug report. You can also long press on the home button too. And I promise that we read every single bug report and that every single one does make a difference. So thanks for coming today. I can't wait to see what high performing apps you deliver in the future. Thank you.